In, in this video, we will start with the current situation of today and we'll move backwards to a earlier point. To begin, we have the interbank foreign exchange market. This from Wikipedia. The interbank market is the top level foreign exchange market where banks exchange different currencies. The banks can either deal with one another directly or through electronic brokering platforms. The electronic brokering services, EBS, and Thomson Reuters Dealing are the two competitors in the electronic brokering platform business, together connect over 1,000 banks. The currencies of most developed countries have floating exchange rates. These currencies do not have fixed values, but rather values that fluctuate relative to other currencies. And so to translate all of that gobbledygook, you essentially have uh, juridic entities functioning with algorithmic entities to manipulate and control the currency exchange across the globe, sort of like if you had a farmer's market and all of those people that sold there, well, they were regulated based off of what they could sell and they all had to pay a fee and they all had to listen to a centralized authority. That is what's going on here. And the idea of values fluctuating relative to other currencies does not mean that those cannot be directly and completely arbitrarily valued, right? It just means that if you value one currency at a certain rate, then it will change relative or other currencies will change relative to that change in the one currency. If you increase the value of the peso, it will in turn have a correlating effect on other uh, types of currencies. <clears throat> That's all it's really saying there. The interbank, mar interbank market is an important segment of the foreign exchange market. It is a wholesale market through which most currency transactions are channeled. Uh, more coded language and gobbledygook. It is mainly used for trading among bankers. The three main consultation constituents of the interbank market are the spot market, forward market, SWIFT, Society for World Bank, interbank financial telecommunications. And those, of course, are your currency controllers which can all be done through a computer program or otherwise what we're calling today algorithmic entities. Now today, mostly everything, not just currency, is controlled electronically and can be done through a computer program. Most people receive their directions in the corporate governmental sectors in pretty much every sphere of, um, of everything, really, through uh, memos and those are often sent through, say, emails or the mail system. However, a letter can be sent through the mail system uh, from the origin of a electronic platform as nearly everything, including the correspondence, is done through online and through, um, through paper, meaning that a lot of people will get directions and directives from a signature or an office without actually v validating the human identity of the individual that is sending those instructions. A person in the military, for example, will get orders from a signature, right? Signed commander, blah, blah, blah. But they want to actually meet that individual. And that could easily have been perpetuated by someone else simply putting a stamp on it, right? Well, in that type of system and that sort of administration, well, the entire global structure of employees and corporations or in governments or anywhere can be automated through an algorithm. Now, this takes us to some fictional explanations, allegedly anyway. Landrew was an advanced computer machine built and programmed by its namesake, Landrew, the leader of the Bretons in the distant past, the computer is equipped with a holographic projector that could display a 3D dimensional image of Landrew. Landrew is built powerfully enough to manage the affairs of an entire planetary population. It established totalitarian rule over Beta 3 for about 6,000 years, managing the affairs of each individual and striving to meet the ambitious goals its builder set it. Its subjects were oblivious to the fact that they were being ruled by a computer. Since Landrew was hidden behind a solid wall, it is likely that its builder intended this. Even millennia later, some of the citizens of Beta 3 believed that the Landrew who ruled their world was the same one who saved it so many centuries ago, and none realized it was a machine. The passing years of peaceful rule had incul inculcated in the people a kind of reflexive worship of Landrew. 
This could be seen even in members of the underground who sought freedom and actively opposed, opposed Landrieu's will. To meet Landrieu's goals, his machine was given the ability to control the attitude and conduct of individuals through a process called absorption. Once absorbed, a living being's individuality and free will were largely subordinated to the instructions and ideas supplied telepathically by Landrieu, within the parameter of Landrieu's guidelines, referred to as the directives. The individual had some free will. Absorbed individuals referred to collectively as the body. Landry viewed the body as analogous to the body of a living being. It referred collectively to the memory of the body and to outsiders as infection. To enforce its will, Landry maintained an army of lawgivers. These brown-robed individuals were under extremely deep control. They lacked all volition except what Landry supplied. When Landry was forced to devote most of its power to solving a paradox, it withdrew its direct influence from its lawgivers, causing them to panic. Lawgivers carried staffs with which they could absorb individuals who were not part of the body or in extremist kill. Landry preferred to absorb its enemies, killing only when it believed it had no choice. In 2167, or 2167, the Archon visited Beta 3 and encountered Landry. The specific sequence of events remains unclear, but from information supplied by the Underground, it can be concluded that some event caused Landry to attack the Archon, possibly the same heat beams it later used against the USS Enterprise. As the Archon's orbit decayed, her crew fled to the surface, where many were absorbed and many others killed. The fate of the Archon remained a mystery for a hundred years. In 2267, the Enterprise arrived at Beta-3, seeking to learn the fate of the Archon. Lieutenant Sulu and O'Neill were dispatched to the surface and were quickly discovered and absorbed, forcing Captain James T. Kirk to organize a large landing party. This landing party also quickly ran into trouble and was captured by Landrew. Several members were absorbed before assistance from Marplon, a member of the Underground, helped Kirk and Spock escape. They confronted Landrew in the Hall of Audiences, confirming what they had earlier guessed, that Landrew was not a living being, but a machine. Landrew threatened Kirk and Spock with obliteration, likening them to a strong infection. It believed their deaths and the deaths of all who had seen them or knew of their existence were necessary to cleanse the memory of the body. Spock realized that it might be possible to reach it by questioning the value of its leadership and asking what Landrew had done to do justice to the full potential of every individual of the body. Kirk forced the machine to confront the truth it had avoided for 6,000 years by reserving creativity to itself. It was destroying the body. It had become evil against which it was charged to protect the body. It expended so much computing power attempting to resolve this paradox that it began to withdraw its influence from even its lawgivers. But it failed. Throughout the encounter, it had repeatedly asserted its identity as Landrew, but in the end, it made a final plea to a man six millennia dead, imploring its creator for help. And then in a shower of sparks and a cloud of smoke, it ceased to operate, freeing both the body from their thraldom and the Enterprise from the threat of destruction. At some point prior to her doing 2380, Landrew somehow became operational again, regaining control of the plant's populace, and was subsequently confronted by Captain Carol Freeman and Captain Jack Ransom of the USS Ceratos who had been sent by Starfleet and once again removed it from power by reiterating Captain Kirk's original message to the battalion's predecessors. Warning signage from Starfleet to not obey the computer was also placed in front of Landry and directed directly onto it. When Landry attempted to order the battalion's Bettons to kill the officers, Freeman threatened to destroy it with the paradox. And this is probably uh, just edited garbage or attempts to obfuscate the um, importance of that particular episode in future uh, propaganda. Now, algorithmic entities refer to autonomous algorithms that operate without human control or interference. Recently, attention is, is being given to the idea of algorithmic entities being granted partial or for legal personhood. Professor Sean Bayern and Professor Lynn M. Lopoki popularized through their papers the idea of having algorithmic entities that obtain legal personhood and the accompanying rights and obligations. Legal algorithmic entities. Al academics and politicians have been discussing over the last few years whether it is possible to have a legal algorithmic entity, meaning that an algorithm or AI is granted legal personhood. In most countries, the law only recognizes natural or real persons and legal persons. The main argument is that behind every legal person or layers of legal persons, there is eventually a natural person. In some countries, there have been made some exceptions to this, and in the form of granting of environmental personhood to rivers and waterfalls, forests and mountains, in the past, some form of personhood also existed for certain religious constructions, such as churches and temples. Certain countries, albeit for public pur publicity purposes, have shown willingness to grant some form of legal personhood to robots. On 27th of October 2017, Saudi Arabia became the first country to 
in the world to grant citizenship to a robot when it gave Sophia a passport. In the same year, official residency status was granted to a chatbot named Shibuya Mirai in Tokyo, Japan. And of course, it is important to note here that the, they are talking about juridic entities themselves doing this with algorithmic entities because there are virtually no sovereign nations across the globe. They are all subsidiaries of the UN directly controlled by a centralized power and that centralized power is wanting to make algorithmic entities um, recognized, right? And they control all of these uh, juridic entities being these country, allegedly independent countries like Japan and Saudi Arabia here. The general consensus is that AI, in any case, cannot be regarded as natural or real person and that granting AI legal personhood at this stage is unwanted from a societal point of view. However, the academic and public discussions continue as AI software becomes more sophisticated and companies are increasingly implementing artificial intelligence to assist in all aspects of business society, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, the perspective of this writer is that um, algorithmic entities are going to be a thing whether you like it or not as most of this stuff is, it is simply declarations uh, to the individuals and it doesn't matter whether or not you disagree with it, it's going to happen unless you, unless people, natural people obviously, in some way organize to destroy this type of garbage, right? Now, this same theme can be found in the television series Stargate Atlantis. Specifically in the episode, 15th episode of the third season quote, uh, titled The Game. Here it states on Stargate.Fandom. For two years, Lieutenant Colonel John Shepard and Dr. Rodney McKay have been playing a computer game left by the ancients in which they develop, uh, they develop countries on opposite sides of a river in competition with one another. While McKay has been pushing his country, Geldar, named after former romantic interest of McKay's, to develop technologically, Shepard has been encouraging his Halona, or Hayona, named by the ancients who created it to develop its military. On a routine survey mission, however, Major Evan Lorne's team discovers that it is not, in fact, a game. Their countries and all the people in them are real, living on a planet somewhere in the Pegasus galaxy, with a satellite network in orbit to track their development and ancient technology to receive the player's instructions. Their civilization has, in fact, been a Lantean social experiment. The team has stumbled upon McKay's country, easily identifiable by the multitude of paintings of his face throughout the village. They go to the planet to investigate. The team visits Geldar first, where they are met by Nola. She immediately recognizes McKay as their oracle and explains that their people were given life thousands of years ago and guided by the oracle through a console, but then all communication suddenly ceased, interrupted by the war with the Wraith. Unknowingly, McKay and Shepard have picked up where they left off. While McKay stays with Nola, Shepard takes Taylor Emigan and Ronan Dex to visit his civilization located across the river. There they meet Baden, the aggressive leader of Hayona. He reveals that the command of Geldar's oracle, the Geldarians, have begun mining for valuable coal under his country. He believes that the proper response is to launch an attack. The two leaders are brought back to Atlantis to learn about the ancient technology and to have their dispute mediated by Dr. Elizabeth Ware. But they refuse to cooperate. Tensions are high and as a result of Shepard McKay's game, Two peoples now stand on the brink of war. Despite their best efforts, neither Weir, McKay, nor Shepard can convince them to make peace. Bad takes advantage of the game room in order to order an attack on the mine. The team returns to the planet to attempt to forge a peace with McKay, accompanied by Ronan in Geldar and Shepard by Taylor in Hyona. Nola reveals that Geldar has bombs, which McKay was unaware of, and sends in one in a dirigible to bomb a Halonan village. Shepard and Taylor are able to harmlessly shoot down the dirigible with a puddle jumper, but Nola is not deterred and orders more bombs sent while Baden orders his army to destroy the Geldar villages. With the situation deteriorating, the team is suddenly beamed to the Daedalus, diverted by Weir on its way back to Earth and check on them. While Colonel Caldwell feels there's nothing more they can do, Shepard has come up with a plan and convinced Caldwell to send them back after McKay and X part of it. Once McKay's work is done, the team discreetly beams back to their respective countries. In Galdar, the Halonan army destroys their villages and bombards the cap with their own bombs. The Oracle console loses power and Nola realizes that they have lost. At the same time, in Halona, the capital is shaken by bombs from Galdar, and the Oracle console also loses power with hundreds dead. Shepard announce, announces that it's game over to Baden. 
After apparent destruction of both countries, McKay and Shepard reveal what really happened with help from Ronan and Taylor. While on the Daedalus, McKay hacked into the consoles and uploaded a doomsday scenario for each country to give them a taste of what war is really like. In reality, both of their armies are standing down waiting for further instructions. No one has been hurt, and the explosions were pinpoint shots from the Daedalus. To add realism to the situation, Nolan and ba Baden are left confronted with the true horror of what war can do to their peoples if they don't stop. Now, regardless of all of the behavior modification and social engineering that is written into that particular last example of propaganda, uh, most are familiar with the Terminator series' um, Skynet. Here on Terminator Wiki, it states that Skynet is an artificial intelligence created by the Cyberdyne systems for SAC NORAD. It grew more intelligent and saw all humans as a threat. Skynet started a nuclear war to bring the human race to extinction and sent survivors to camps to be annihilated. Humans rose up against Skynet under John Connor's leadership. Eventually, the Resistance managed to break through its defense grid. Because annihilating Connor, then to shatter the Resistance, wouldn't have made a difference, Skynet decided there was another way to win, by annihilating Connor in the past. It managed to research time travel and send a Terminator in 1984 to annihilate Sarah Connor before she could give birth to John. That's really weird, the use of the word annihilate there, rather than, say, kill or murder. In the Templist timeline... Well, yeah, like annihilation is usually used to talk about groups, like where it says annihilate humanity, but then using that word on an individual is kind of weird. In the Tempest timeline, Skynet's master control has been destroyed in 2029. The Resistance believed that this would cause the entire defense network to collapse into chaos without a leader. However, Skynet's many network complexes continue to fight the war as they did not need a leader to function and thus could not surrender. A lot of these themes seem strangely similar to uh, evidence of what's going on today. So let's move on to a document from the past to give us an idea of exactly what system that was developed many centuries or in case yeah, many centuries ago, is being run, right? How, how does this, how do we get here in such a strange, centralized, controlled society when there have been all of these wars for independence that seem to either did not achieve what they set out to do, or at least in, in this example, we find that it was simply re-emplaced later. So this is the United States Stamp Duties. It's a little pamphlet, about 54 pages, containing all the acts of Congress and decisions of Commissioner of Internal Revenue relating thereto, carefully compared with and corrected by official copies of the same, San Francisco, 1863. Now it states, all acts of Congress. However, it does not have anything prior to 1860s, the 1860s, right? So... Does that mean that prior to the 1860s, the Constitutional Congress did not, in fact, pass things called acts? It's an interesting question that uh, might be difficult to find evidence for, considering the amount of suppression and elimination of documents and things like that, and editing, of course. Here it states, San Francisco, March 16th, 1863. I certify that having carefully compared the sections of the Acts of Congress and the decisions of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, in reference to revenue stamps herewith printed, with official and authentic copies of the same in this office, I believe them to be accurate and correct. W.M.Y. Patch, Collector Internal Revenue, 1st District, California. Now remember that word there, collector. It's a very important term. General provisions of the law in reference to stamp duties from the law of July 1st, 1862. Now that, of course, is not going to be the Constitution, which is the supreme law, but they don't recognize it. This is a different law. Section 94. And be it further enacted that on and after the first day of October, 1862, there shall be levied, collected, and paid for in and respect of the several instruments, matters, and things mentioned and described in the schedule, Mark B, hereunto enact, annexed, or for 
or in respect of the vellum, parchment, or paper upon which such instruments, matters, or things, or any of them shall be written or printed by any person or persons or party who shall make them, shall make, sign, or issue the same, or for whose use or benefit the same shall be made, signed, or issued, the several duties or sums of money set down in figures against the same respectively or otherwise specified or set forth in said schedule. So that gives you an idea of exactly what they're doing here. But we'll find out later in this document that even though it's titled stamp duties, it does extend onto far many, many more things. It Practically speaking, it is the control mechanism through which tyranny has been leveraged onto the American population and practically the entire globe. Terms upon which stamps are sold. Office of Internal Revenue, San Francisco, March 20th, 1863. The department at Washington sells stamps under this regulation issued by Honorable... Uh, yeah, Honorable, sure. A geo, um, there's probably stands for George S. Bootwell, the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, dated January 12, 1863. Revenue stamps may be ordered from this office in quantities to suit purchasers. Orders should cover remittances of Treasury notes or an original certificate of United States Assistant Treasurer or designated depository of a deposit made for the purchase of stamps. The following commission payable in stamps will be allowed. Uh, purchases of $50 or more, two per centum. Blah, blah, blah. I publish this in order that there may be no misunderstandings or need for explanations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I sell stamps and allow the same rates of commission as are authorized by the government and take legal tender notes, therefore. Orders accompanied by remittances may be sent by mail or express, and the stamps will be promptly forwarded by return of same. Any information in my power in reference to their use, I am always ready cheerfully to give. W.M.Y. Patch, Collector, 1st District, California. Yeah, that doesn't sound like somebody who thinks themselves a dictator or rather a uh, petty tyrant. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Apart from all of the other parts of this document that are egregious, under Section 5, it states, and be it further enacted, that all contracts, loans, or sales of gold and silver coin and bullion not made in accordance with this act shall be wholly and absolutely void. That's important for the U.S. Constitution. And in addition to the penalties provided in the act to which this amendment, any party to said contract may at any time within one year from the date of the contract Bring suit before any court of competent jurisdiction to recover back for his own use and benefit the money paid on any contract not made in accordance with this act. What that particular section does is it takes all of the debts prior to the war for independence and the establishment of the Constitution suddenly valid, and it voids all payments of debts acted under the Constitution. So that part, that small section contained in this stamp duties booklet is the reason why we have a quote national debt. And it's the same debt that the colonists had prior to the year of Declaration of Independence, 1775. Section six, and be it further enacted well, actually, I think it might be 1776 that the Declaration of Independence was signed, technically. But all that stuff was happening in 1775. Anyway, and it be further enacted that Section 110, and hereby is amended as follows, any memorandum, check, receipt, or other written or printed evidence of an amount of money to be paid on demand or at time designated shall be considered as a promissory note within the meaning of this section and shall be stamped accordingly, and that schedule B following said Section B and is hereby amended so that any inland bill of exchange draft or order for the payment of any sum of money exceeding $20 otherwise than at site or on demand, and any promissory note shall, in lieu of the duties prescribed in Schedule B, have a stamp or stamps affixed thereon denoting a duty upon every sum of $200 or any fractional part thereof, if payable on demand or at any time not exceeding 33 days, including the grace from the date or site of one cent. 
and so on and so forth. Also, it states, no conveyance, deed, mortgage, or writing whereby any lands, tenements, realty, or other property shall be sold, granted, assigned, or otherwise conveyed, or shall be made a security for the payment of any sum of money, shall be required to pay a stamp duty of more than the sum of $1,000, anything to the contrary, notwithstanding. That word right there is using notwithstanding correctly how it's used in the Constitution. It is obviously put in there as a joke because the people that put this stuff into force were intentionally engaging in treason to remove the supreme law of the land, the U.S. Constitution, and put back the old laws of empire. And here it talks about all of their, uh, how we as Americans in the United States, we all have to pay these fraudulent taxes, but they don't, and their agents don't. Now, here's some other interesting portions of this document. Here it states under section 27, and be it further enacted that any person who shall offer for sale after the 13th of September, 1863, any of the articles named in Schedule C of the Act, to which this Act is an amendment, whether the articles so offered are imported or are foreign or domestic manufactured, shall be deemed the manufacturer thereof and subject to all the duties, liabilities, and penalties in said Act imposed in regard to the sale of such articles without the use of the proper stamp or stamps as in, as in said Act is required. Now, the reason why this particular small section about the commerce is important, we will see later on in this video when we look at the period prior to the War for Independence. Now, in this uh, last part of uh, this document, Section 37, and being further enacted that this act, except where otherwise indicated, shall take effect from and after its passage, and all acts and parts of acts repugnant to the provisions of this act be and in the same are hereby repealed. So, it appears what they're attempting to do is repeal the U.S. Constitution, considering there are a great number of sections of that document specifically that would be, quote, repugnant to this or, and part of its acts. Provided that the existing laws shall extend to and be enforced as modified for the collection of the duties imposed by this act for the prosecution and punishment of all offenses and for the recovery, collection, distribution, and remission of all fines, penalties, and forfeitures as fully and effectually as is every regulation, penalty, forfeiture, provision, clause, matter, and thing to that effect in the existing laws contained had been inserted in and reenacted by this act. And there it goes saying it is re-enacting what had been done before. So let's go to that particular document, the U.S. Constitution. Here we find it states, no capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. Here in this section, it states exactly what that direct tax is. And it states that Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of ten years in such manner as they shall by law direct. Well, there you go. That is the only form of taxation that is allowed by Congress, which makes the U.S. Constitution, quote, repugnant to the acts of 1863 that we just looked at about stamp duties. Now, the situation goes even further, where the Congress is supposed to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures not an algorithmic entity of a international banker's market. They are not the ones that are supposed to be regulating currency. Also, we have this particular section, which is important for those 1863 stamp duties. 
No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. And that particular section was subsequently referenced in those Acts of 1863. Now this takes us to our example prior to the War for Independence, where we find that everything that was enacted in those stamp duties was reemplacing all of the specific things that the colonists had such a big problem with, and a lot of people died fighting over that particular question. They were victorious, but then later, through fraud, it was reemplaced in the 1860s. Now, this is Trade and Empire, the British Customs Service in Colonial America, 1660 to 1775 by Thomas C. Barrow, Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1967. Copyright 1967 by the President and Fellows of Harvard College, All Rights Reserved, distributed in Great Britain by Oxford University Press, London, Library of Congress, catalog card number, blah, 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 pretty United States of America. Here it states on page 198. The Stamp Act was an integral part of the Grenville program. It was designed to provide the revenue needed to support the imperial projects through the assessment of internal taxes in the colonies. Many years earlier, the governor of New York, on hearing of a project to extend the stamp tax to the colonies, warned that the people of North America are quite strangers to any duty but such as they raise themselves. The Grenville ministry ignored such cautions and in one decisive act imposed an internal stamp tax on the colonists. The resultant uproar surprised even experienced colonial officials with its intensity. News of the passage of the Stamp Act was at first greeted with an outburst of angry oratory. Patrick Henry rose to immediate intercolonial fame on the news of the stand he had taken in Virginia House of Burgesses in support of resolutions condemning the action of Parliament. At the suggestion of the Massachusetts Assembly, an intercolonial meeting was summoned. Famous Stamp Act Congress. From this assembly came resolutions denying the right of Parliament to impose internal taxes in the colonies and requesting immediate repeal. Interestingly, two of the 13 resolutions concerned the previous acts of Parliament as well as the Stamp Act. Article 9 complained that the duties imposed by several late acts of Parliament were extremely burdensome and grievous, and the collection of them absolutely impractical because of the shortage of specie. The 11th article stated that the restrictions imposed by several later acts of Parliament on the trade of these colonies will render them unable to purchase the manufacturers of Great Britain. There was some thought given at the Congress to demanding the repeal of all the acts of trade as well as the Stamp Act, but the majority settled for an express denial of Parliament's right to impose internal taxes, with no direct statement regarding its right to regulate trade through the collection of duties. By autumn 1765, it was clear that the colonists intended to make a determined stand against the Stamp Act. When the names of those appointed to collect the new taxes became known, they were burned in effigy, some forced to resign their commissions, while the homes and property of others were damaged by rioters. There was no doubt as to what the colonists would do when the stamps first arrived, but there was a question as to what the various royal officers would do. The first cargo of stamps arrived in Boston in, se Boston in September. Governor Bernard clearly indicated the problem created for the colonial authorities by the unwise haste of the English ministry enacting this measure to send hither ordinances for execution which the people have publicly protested against as illegal and not binding on them, without first providing a power to enforce obedience is tempting them to revolt. In a difficult situation, the royal officials performed as might have been expected. Each refused to take responsibility for what happened and excused his concession to the popular fur on the grounds of lack of support from other authorities. With the stamp collector forced to resign his office by the mob, Governor Bernard used the excuse that he was not authorized to distribute the stamps to have them stored in safety in the fort in Boston Harbor. His denial of responsibility left the other authorities unsure as to as how to conduct their affairs. Should they carry on as usual without using stamp paper, or should they refuse to permit any transaction at all? Bernard hoped that if all the ports were closed and the courts as well, the anarchy and economic pressure would force the colonists to accept the act. The only difficulty was that, lacking the strong support that should have been provided from home, no official was willing to make such an all-out all out stand at the risk of his life, property, and position. The English ministry had ignited a conflagration at a time when the colonial administrative authorities were ill-equipped to uphold the imperial policies. For the customs officers, the problem centered on the question of in entering and clearing vessels without stamped forms. The comptroller and the acting collector, Hale, having returned to England and Boston, asked the surveyor general for advice. 
Temple evaded giving them a direct answer and merely told them to apply to the attorney and advocate generals for an opinion. When the customs officers did so, they received further evasive answers. The attorney general went so far as to have a friend write that he was ill with rheumatism in his right arm and shoulder, and he could not hold a pen or attend any business. By the 7th of December, the customs officers had given in to the pressure of the merchants, and after obtaining from the former collector of the stamp taxes a statement that no stamp with paper was available, they began to enter and clear ships with certificates of their own devising, showing that no stamps were available. Typically, the surveyor general who had helped them in no way took credit for holding the merchants off as long as possible. Temple wrote the commissioners of the customs that I found means to put them off from the 1st of November till the 16th instant, when the collector and comptroller assured me that not only their lives and property, but the king's money was in the greatest danger. The comedy enacted at Boston was repeated elsewhere. In Virginia, the man who carried the stamps to the colony merely said that he had none available for the customs houses. With that excuse at hand, and Surveyor General authorized the collectors to clear vessels with certificate that stamps were not available. In Philadelphia, many ships had hastily taken on a fraction of a cargo before the stamps arrived, and thus were free to continue loading and clearing with no difficulty, having commenced loading before the act was effective. By the time this ruse had lost its value, the collector was willing to follow the example of other ports and issue clearances as usual. The Surveyor General of the Western Mill District noted that impossibilities will not be expected of us, and from the nature of our cause, our conduct will stand justified. While the Surveyor General of the Eastern District explained his actions in various ways, but emphasized that he really had no choice in improving the issuance of regular clearances. The unfortunate Stamp Act was repealed early in 1766. English pride was assuaged by the coupling of repeal with the Declaratory Act asserting parliamentary supremacy over the colonies. In spite of the fine words, the imperial cause had been severely damaged by the ill-timed effort to tax the colonies before either the colonial authorities or the English government was willing or able to back the attempt with the forceful measures required to enforce an unpopular measure on a recalcitrant people. Well, that's okay because they got it in there eventually in the 1860s under the fraudulent war, so-called civil war. Here in a different part of the book, it summarizes the topic. Frederick Lord North was a man of habitual diffidence. That means uh, sort of like self-doubt or humility or, and modesty based off of uh, self-doubt. While his conciliatory disposition and good-natured indolence made him an attractive colleague, he was an odd candidate for immortality as the minister who lost us America. North himself at times undoubtedly was bewildered by the tides that swept him and the empire he administered into civil war and disunion. He meant well but lost an empire and the causes of his fare must have been obscure even to him. However, North personally might have taken comfort from the analysis offered by William Knox, an ex experienced and perceptive colonial administrator. Recalling his first experiences in America, Knox observed that it was no small degree of ast astonishment that perceived a total war want of plan or system in the British government, as well at the time of their establishment as in their future management, that the seeds of disunion were sown in the first plantation in every one of them, and that a general disposition to independence of this country prevailed throughout the whole. Certainly, the history of the Colonial Customs Service conformed to the pattern described by Knox. The central theme in the story of the service was its total inadequacy for the assignment with which it was entrusted. The early years from 17, 1673 to the rise of Walpole were marked by a stubborn and general resistance to the work of the customs officers. In some colonies, opposition reached from the office of the governor down to the smallest of the local courts. In others, legislatures were the center of resistance. In all the colonies, merchants and businessmen generally were irritated at the restrictions on their activities and let their support to efforts to emasculate the trade laws. As Lord Bello, Bellomont wrote in 1699, A collector's is the most ungrateful office in these plantations that can be. If he is just to his trust in looking into their trade, they hate him mortally. By means of legal harassment, physical violence, and intimidation, the colonists successfully prevented the customs officers from enforcing a strict observance of the acts of trade and navigation. In the face of determined colonial opposition, the customs officers found their work nearly impossible. If the Americans would not cooperate voluntarily, the trade laws had to be enforced over their objections. 
But the distances involved, the isolation of the royal officers, and the weakness of all royal authority in America soon made it apparent that without drastic reform, such an effort was not feasible. As Caleb Heathcote reported in 1716, there was an abundance of mistakes in the management of affairs, whereby his majesty's interest is greatly hurt, and many of the services neglected and underperformed, and things are wrong on so many accounts. A few years later, Heathcote went to the heart of the problem in another report. As long as the colonists had a power as they imagined of making laws separate from the crown, they, they'll never be wanting to lessen the authority of the king's officers who, by hindering them from a full freedom of legal trade, are accounted enemies to the growth and prosperity of their little commonwealths. That's clearly a, a put-down, right? Little commonwealths. The fact was that it was impossible to control the economic life of the Americans without also supervising their political and governmental activities in all their aspects. The mercantile system required the existence of a higher degree of both political and social unity as a condition of its success. But we certainly have that today. Recognizing that the commercial laws could never be implemented effectively until life in the colonies should be made to conform to the dictates of the English government. Heathcote, Archibald Cummings, Sir William Keith, and others suggested that a revenue should be raised in America, which could be used to defray the expenses of the various governments, freeing the officials from dependence on the local inhabitants and strengthening the hand of royal government generally. Ironically, during the period from 1715 to 1725, nearly all the measures later enacted under Grenville and Townsend were suggested from the strengthening of the matter admiralty courts to extension of the stamp duties to America and the use of a tax on molasses to raise their revenue. In spite of warnings that a neglect therein may with time be attended with very ill consequences, the English government failed to act. Under Walpole and the succeeding Whig ministries, the colonies were left to develop in their relative freedom. The policy of salutary neglect enabled the Whigs to concentrate on England's own internal problems on the creation of a general prosperity and the support of the Hanoverian monarchy, and later on the renewed rivalry with France. During these years, the colonists had little reason to complain. English authority, still theoretically supreme, was not exercised in fact. The royal officers in the colonies, left to their own devices, degenerated into creoles and at length forgot the mother country and her interests. In many ways, these years were the golden age of England's relations with her colonies. Compared with the disasters which followed under George III, they have taken on an added luster. But it is worth remembering that this surface harmony was achieved through a partial resignation of authority and responsibility by England. The theories of empire were not altered, they were merely ignored. As George Bancroft remarked, Walpole's policies were generous and safe, but can a minister excuse his own acts of despotic legislation by his neglect to enforce them? Bancroft added, Woe to the British statesman who should hold it a duty to enforce the British laws. The Molasses Act, in theory, a prohibition of trade with the foreign islands, but in, practical, or in practice, merely one more neglected statute was a fitting memorial to these years of Whig leadership. Commencing with the Ministry of Granville, the English government attempted to correct the damage done by the years of neglect. The Customs Service was reformed and enlarged, the Admiralty Courts were strengthened, troops were stationed in America, and steps were taken to raise a colonial revenue to finance these reforms. Unfortunately, the machinery of enforcement in the colonies was rusted from years of disuse and was strained to the breaking point by these radical innovations, which aroused an angry response in America and created an effective, united colonial opposition. Under Townsend, a new and more comprehensive effort was undertaken. New revenues were raised, certain civil officials were taken into the pay of the English government, the Customs Service was strengthened by the appointment of commissioners to reside in America, and once again the Admiralty Courts were reorganized. But the time needed to make this program effective was not available. The colonial opposition shortly caused most of Townsend's plans to be abandoned, and in spite of the cautious approach adopted by Lord North, relations between the colonies and England had become so strained that just one mistake involving tea led to an open rupture. In any list of grievances drawn up by the colonists to explain the reasons for that open rupture, the operation of the Customs Service ranked high. An American reading that passage in the Declaration of Independence, which denounces the king because he had erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance, would understand this reference to the customs officials. More specifically, the complaints in the Declaration that the colonists had been deprived in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury and transported beyond seas to be tried for pretend offenses, singled out the Admiralty Court system, which was a major element in the customs apparatus. 
And the whole purpose, the basic function of the custom service, was protested in the declaration when the colonists complained that the king had combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution, giving his assent to their acts of pretend legislation for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. These were specific grievances, ones Americans could understand. But in a larger sense, the Customs Service played a central role in the coming of the Revolution, as it did in the history of the first British Empire because its operation was related directly to the procurement of revenue, which in essence was and is the key to effective government. Again, William Knox went to the heart of the problem when he explained the American opposition to Grenville's Stamp Act in this way. The collection of duties would occasion a considerable increase in the number of persons holding office under the Crown and deriving their appointment from British interests and would be a severe check upon the propaga propagation of anti-monarchical principles within the colonies and upon illicit connections with foreign countries. Later, at the end of the revolution, Knox summed up the basis of the dispute more succinctly when he asserted it was better to have no colonies at all than not to have them subservient to the maritime strength and commercial interests of Great Britain. Benjamin Franklin, in his satirical rules for reducing a great empire to a small one, Observe the same central issue of revenue from an American point of view. This is another reason for applying part of the revenue and large salaries to such governors and judges given as, given as their commissions are during your pleasure only, forbidding them to take any salaries from their provinces that thus the people may no longer hope any kindness from the governors or in crown cases any justice from their judges. John Adams put the issue more succinctly still at the end of his life reminiscing about the danger inherent in texts tax levied under the original Molasses Act, and observed that it had been collected, it would have provided a fund amply sufficient to pay all the salaries of all the governors upon the continent and all the judges of Admiralty too. With the steady growth of the molasses and sugar trade, he added, the receipts would have increased until they were sufficient to bribe any nation less knowing and less virtuous than the people of America to the voluntary surrender of all their liberties. The issue was control of government, and in revenue lay the key to sovereignty. The public debate between the Americans and the English over the issue of taxation in which the Customs Service was caught up after 1764 centered on the nature of the old colonial system. The English, pointing to the theories of the past, claimed complete sovereignty, an inseparable component of which was the right of taxation. The colonists, relying on the practice of the past, asserted that the imperial constitution provided for the protection of their rights and interests. In this dispute between the theory and the practice of the past, the question of right or wrong is irrelevant. The inflexibility of the British theory of empire is con its continued hold on the minds of England's leaders was in opposition to the realities of colonial practices and desires. The result was a conflict which was resolved only by a recourse to arms. Now we still go, go still earlier to get a uh, context of the situation in another part of the world as it generally relates to the global apparatus of trade and revenue. Levitine Adventure, The Travels and Missions of the Chevalier d'Arvu, 1653-1697, by Warren H. Lewis. Under Chapter 1, it states, Insurance and freight must have been heavy, for Postia carried a valuable cargo, merchandise worth 25,000 livres and 25,000 cash, to say nothing of the passengers' money and of the trade goods of the officers and crew. Cash and bullion, of course, still travel about the world, but not under the conditions which in the earlier part of the 17th century made them the chief French export to Levant. For some reason, perhaps because business over the Asian trade routes was still largely conducted by barter, the Ottoman Empire minted remarkably little coin. But the barter system cannot be used between Frank and Turk because French exports to Turkey were insufficient to pay for their imports from the Levant, and the trade could be balanced only by the French exporting cash to pay for their purchases. This state of affairs did not embarrass the French exporter of eat cash, for the sale of his return cargoes to Western markets more than recouped him for the cash exported. But it was a constant worry to Colbert and his successors, who held that the process was draining away the wealth of France. Already the export of cash had been prohibited, but to conduct the Levant trade on any other basis in the then infant stage of French manufacturers proved impossible, and the wholesale evasion of the edict was winked at. It was not until 1682, when French factories were turning out export goods in large quantities, that a new edict making it illegal to export more than a third of a ship's laden in cash was strictly enforced. No doubt much of Postion's cash consisted of five sole pieces of penny, whose manufacture expressly for export to Levant was a profitable sideline for the French mint. For in the general dearth of cash, the Turk was glad to buy them for seven and a half souls. 
But unfortunately, this traffic had a boomerang effect. Coiners manufactured and exported five, base five soul bits, many of which found their way back to Marseille, where by 1666, the quantity of bad money in circulation was a serious nuisance. Ultimately, the Sultan instituted a new customs branch staffed by expert money treers, which dealt solely with imported cash, and after this, the amount of base money in circulation rapidly diminished. Thank you. If you had have enjoyed this video, please check out my other content, uh, like it, subscribe to my channels, and there are free books available at the link. And if you so choose, you may support my work at Cash App or buy me a coffee. Thank you.